we greet you this morning in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is Bishop Archie from Simple Truth Ministries, and we thank God for another day, another opportunity, another time, another place, another uh, spiritual setting where the Lord has given permission and opportunity to come before the people of God and to tr uh, bring his holy word. Uh, we greet you on behalf of Pastor Carolyn Archie, our Simple True family. God bless you this morning, all of our saints, families, friends, those who continue to join and support us. We just give God the praise and the glory for you. This again <clears throat> is the day, Psalm 118 and 24, that the Lord has made, and we rejoice and we are glad in it. We're glad in this day because this day begins our uh, annual 21-day fast. This is our fast where we just uh, come aside during this season for these 21 days from today until Resurrection Sunday. And our fast uh, be, will begin directly uh, at six o'clock this evening. Six o'clock this evening is when our fast begins as it's in the uh, biblically speaking from evening till morning. That's when the Lord's first day begins. So at six o'clock this evening, our fast will officially begin. And we see on the screen our theme, our focus, tell your situation about your God. Our uh, fasting scripture will come from Psalms 18 verses 1 through 3, which we will read uh, um, later on because it'll be a part of our, it will be the foundation of our message. But in this Psalm, this is where David declares who God is to him. And this is what we are going to declare in this fast. It's going to be a, a time, it's going to be a uh, season where we just, again, we tell our situations about our God. Now, we're not saying in this, we're not saying that we don't pray to God at all. Of course not. We know that we have enough scripture that tells us that we are to bring our petitions to him, that we are to bring our requests to him, that we know when he has heard us, then we have the confidence that our prayer has been answered. All of these scriptures but where we're just going a little bit today in this, in this, these three weeks is to say, and we'll say this again during the message, it is to say that we want to let uh, the situations know. And on next week, we're going to give scriptures that support speaking to situations, but we let them know that we know who God is that we're not always going to tell the God, oh, there's a storm, but we tell the storm, God is going to deliver us. God is going to get us through this. This is the, the pattern of speech. This is the pattern, the mindset that we're going to have during this three weeks of fasting. And it'll take some discipline. It'll take some uh, reprogramming a little bit, but it is not a formula. It's not a gimmick. It's not something that is just to be cute in the spirit. It is to say, Lord, we know who you are. We don't have to, to come to you and ask you, can you do this? Can you do that? But we want to speak directly to the situation and say, this is who my God is. This is who my God is. And we'll go into that a little bit more as we go into the scriptures. But in this, we what we do want to say to you is, that um, our church, our annual church fast again begins today. Fast information has been emailed to all of the members and we've had a, a request for uh, the fasting prospectus today. So after the service, we're gonna send that right out and we're getting ready to speak to the mountain about God. We're gonna speak to the mountain about who God is. We're gonna say in our pattern of speech, you know, sickness, my God is a deliverer. Sickness, my God is my strength. This is according to what David said in Psalm 18, verses one through one and two. And then he gave his summation in verse three. And there's much that's in that particular Psalm. 
So all saints are, of course, welcome to join in. We uh, have, many of you have our uh, email address. You go on Facebook, look under Simple Truth Ministries or look under Bishop Archie and post on Facebook. If you don't have my email address, Bishop, I'd like a copy of what you're handing out for the fast. We'll get it to you as soon as possible. This is not our church. This is not us. This is not where we're separate from anybody else. This is for any believer who desires to be a part of this fast. And one of the things that we're also looking at in this fast is uh, our new church home. You know, we we were encouraged on last, uh, the last Thursday or Friday, I don't remember what day it was, I believe it was Friday, by one of my brothers in the gospel who said, look, the vision, I know you can be discouraged after a while, but the vision hasn't died. And he agreed with me in prayer that uh, as he has recently received a new church building, and I know where the building is, we've passed by it and it's, amen, Lord, thank you. And it took him a year of prayer to open up this particular door. And he just said, I pass this on to you, my brother. And we just prayed and believed God. And as God has said already in this year of 2022, that in the Hebrew, the, uh, we're in the decade of pay where we speak certain things, that um, the number two in the Hebrew is the word uh, bay, which is house. So it is the year where we seek the house and we speak the house. And because that uh, bet, I said bay, bet, because that word it, the symbol for house is hidden in the word for uh, pay, that it is to seek the house and speak the house. There's a lot. We did that on watch night. We'll do it again as we're getting ready to go forward. But all saints are welcome to join in this fast and believe God with us that we're close, close, close to the house that the Lord wants us to receive for the kingdom and for his glory. And we also want to say this, that there are times, that there are times when you are anxious to fast. So I got to come aside. There are some who are fasting on a weekly basis. They have their fast day set aside. Amen. And absolutely. And then there are going to be times when fasting seems to be, oh, this is another burden. Things are hard enough. The only pleasure I really got was when I could sit down with a good plate of food and forget my problems for a while. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't do drugs, but I could do some food. I could have some coffee in the morning. I could have some uh, steak at night, whatever you, it is. And now here's another burden and I got to go through this. But God is saying, stay focused and trust him. Trust him. He has blessed lessons for us to learn through this time and through this season. Stay focused and to trust God. This is what he is looking for us to do in this particular fasting season. So here again, as we often would do, and as we often uh, see, and as we often say with this fast, we usually do two meals a day, uh, breakfast and dinner, light meals. We're not looking to load up on breakfast to carry us throughout the day, load up on dinner. So that'll last us until you know, and we just eat whatever we want to eat. God is trusting us. You're on your spiritual honor. Uh, for some, as we have in the handout that we gave, there are some that uh, it is what is called a soul fast, a soul fast. And that is for those who are kind of new to fasting, where you, you may not necessarily change your diet that much, even though it should be eliminating some of that junk food from it. But in that soul fast, there are some uh, options that we have where uh, you fast from maybe Facebook, you fast from texting, you fast from the iPhone, you fast from uh, watching television for for a, a period of time. You know, there's other ways to do it, but you don't just leave those things alone. You replace them with reading your word. You replace them with prayer. You replace, replace them with time that you spend with God. There are different ways to fast. Ultimately, it is abstaining from food 
and even from drink, depending on where the Lord leads you. So here again, what you do want to know, the handout states it, but what you do want to know is that we are changing our, our natural diet for a while and we're uh, um, abstaining from the the uh, some of the things that are what are pleasurable in the sense of certain television shows or going certain places or I watch this movie and there's some things we shouldn't be doing anyway you know and when we're fasting we make it a point not to do this this show uh it it generates certain thoughts this show mocks god this show has profanity it this show has loose morals and we shouldn't be watching it anyway this is a time to really make sure that we don't watch some of these television shows that we don't engage in some of this activity this is our time of fasting so again from from uh today march the uh 27th today at 6 p.m going to april 17th that is resurrection sunday that is where we, we, those who've been with us, you know, we have our service. And then when we have the service at the conclusion of the service, we declare that the fast is finished. During these three weeks, God wants you to talk to your situations. God wants you to talk to your issues, to your problems and tell them who he is. Lack of finances. I want to tell you that my God is a provider according to his word in uh, Philippians, he said he will supply all of my need according to his riches and glory. This is the beginning. This is the sample of the language that God wants us to have. And we're going to start at this foundational scripture in Psalms 18 verses one through three. Amen. So join me if you would in a word of prayer before we go to our praise song today and uh, then our announcements. And then we will go to the word of the Lord, as we go before his throne of grace, even now. Father, in the name of your son and our savior, Jesus Christ, Father, we thank you. We praise you. We worship you, adore, magnify, and lift you up. We love you today, and we thank you. What David declared in his Psalms is the, the heart of what we would declare before you today. Lord God, our rock, our deliverer, our fortress, our horn, our salvation, our high tower. This is, this is who you are today. And Lord God, we come before you entering into this season where we're going to come aside and just seek you even the more. Lord God, we're going to come aside and hear what you would say to us. We're going to come aside and declare as you speak certain things to us in our spirit that our issues, our circumstances, our situations shall be exposed and we'll declare unto them what thus saith the Lord and who our God is. So Father, we thank you for trusting us with this assignment today. We thank you for trusting us with this season. We thank you for bringing us to this time of complete and just an awesome deliverance that you have for us in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for health being just being improved. We thank you for strength being added to. We thank you for uh, all of those who are in financial need that, Lord God, they are beginning to see turnarounds in their situation. Lord God, we thank you for this season that you brought us to where you, God, you have said this will be the beginning of new things for you. And just hold on and get to where I want you to get to in the name of Jesus. Bless your servant to bring forth your word. Bless your people to hear it and to apply it and to walk in it. This is our prayer and we offer it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank God. Please receive at this time our minister, Barbara Scholars, who's going to minister to us uh, our song for today. New Wine is the name of the song in Jesus' name. Please receive Minister Barbara Shoulders. Praise and glory be unto God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we come to give you glory. 
Praises and glory be unto God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we come to give you glory. Father, we come to give you honor. Father, we come to bow down before you. Father, we come to worship you. We adore you, Adonai. You are the great I am. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the beginning. You are the end. You are the author and the finisher of our faith. And we enter into your gates with thanksgiving, O oh God. We enter into your courts with praise. We are so thankful, God, and we bless your holy name. We thank you for loving us on today, O oh God. We thank you for keeping us in the hollow of your hand. We bless you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We thank you. Come, Holy Spirit. Have thine own way in this service. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. In the crushing. In the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil, I now surrender. You are breaking new ground. So I yield to you and to your careful hand. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. So make me a vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing but all you have given me. Jesus, make new wine out of me. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil I now surrender. You're breaking new ground. So I yield to you and to your careful hands. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. So make me a vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing, but all you have given me. Jesus, make new wine out of me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Cause where there is new wine, there is new power. Where there is freedom and the kingdom is here. I lay down my offering to carry a new wine today. Lay down my off. 
offering to carry your new one. I lay down my offering to carry your new one today. Make me an offering, make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing, but all you have given me. Jesus, make new wine out of me. Jesus, bring 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 new wine out of me. Because where there is new wine, there is new power. And where there is freedom, your kingdom is here. I lay down my offering to carry your new wine. I lay down my offering to carry your new so lay down your offering to carry the new one. Lay down your offering to carry the new one. Lay down your offering to carry the new one today. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. Lay down your offering so that you can receive new wine. What is new wine? And it's, it's several places in Matthew chapter nine, in Mark uh, chapter five, in Luke also, all of them speak of where Jesus said, you don't put new wine in old wine skins. In other words, you don't put the new, uh, uh, in the, their custom, the fresh wine that was would put in an old uh, brittle wine skin that they didn't have, you know, they have uh, jars and, and bottles. They put it in wine skin, animal cloth. And if it was old and brittle, you didn't put new wine in there because it would break it. So what do you do? You're not going to throw away the new wine. You're going to change the wine skin. And this is what the song is saying. It's going to be new wine. And we know wine, you know, we don't want to think in terms of the alcoholic. That's not what it represents in scripture. As the song said, new, where there is new wine, there is new power. Where there is new wine, there is new power. It was not alcoholic wine. It was of uh, the, the common drink, but it wasn't one to get people drunk. And there were some who would put st things in it or overdo it and get drunk. And that's not what the Bible uh, promotes. But here, we want to be new wineskins. We were new, made new when we were, received Jesus as our Savior and we were regenerated. But there's an ongoing process, an ongoing process where we are being made new. And as our minister Barbara saying, where there's new wine, there is new power. There is new power. So uh, just preparing ourselves during this time of fasting, during this time of coming aside, during this time of praise and worship, where we will receive new power because we've come aside to the Lord. We've said, I surrender. We've said, you know, I'm, and it doesn't mean I'm newly saved and I'm new and knowing new things. It is, I surrender afresh and anew. 
so that I can receive new power for the days ahead, for the situations and the circumstances that are going to come. And how I will know how to respond, how to deal with it, how to handle it in the name of Jesus. We thank God for our minister, Barbara Scholars, and the, the anointed worship session. And as you saw how it began with all of what was said, who God is, Adonai, and who God is, we're in the hollow of your hand. We rejoice. All of these phrases that were used to declare who God is, and that's where God is taking us during this time of fasting, knowing who he is, knowing who he is and saying it just the way that we would say sometimes, uh, and we've seen different people on television or uh, just in life in general, where they may be in trouble. They may be uh, not uh, uh, getting arrested or, or not given some kind of benefit. And they'll say, do you know who I am? Or do you know how who my husband is or my uh, boss is? Do you know who I work for? These types of comments. Same thing with God, even to a higher level, obviously, that God is wants our, the situation to be told who God is. And again, we're going to lay a foundation today from the, uh, the Psalm uh, 18, and we're going to touch a little bit on Romans chapter 8. But then on next week, we're going to see biblical support for speaking to situations. We're going to see that support. So this is part one and part two, if you would, in Jesus's name. Amen. Let's uh, look at our announcements before we go into God's word today. And our announcements on, uh, as we, you know, today at 6 p.m., our 2022-21 day, day fast begins six o'clock tonight. You know, you uh, have your day and it doesn't mean, again, load up on food or anything of that nature, that you spend the time preparing in prayer, that you spend the time, uh, whatever it is your activities are, then to six o'clock, you come aside for a word of prayer and entering into this time of fasting. Amen. On Friday, uh, April the 1st, we're going to have our Bible study at 8 p.m. And our topic will be the horn of my salvation, the horn of my salvation. Now, this is a phrase that David uses in Psalm 18, uh, verse 2. And we're going to touch on it just for a quick word today, but we're going to go into it a little more deeply because that's not that clear and it, it, you know, just will take some time to study that. So on Friday, April 1st, 8 p.m., we're going to have in our Bible study the topic and the discussion, the horn of my salvation, the horn of my salvation. That's going to be our topic this Friday. On next Sunday, April the 3rd, communion, we have our regular service, but we will be observing communion also. So that'll be next Sunday. So please prepare yourself with your juice and your bread. And obviously that's not a part of the fasting. That's not considered a meal, but have your juice and your bread ready on next Sunday. And we will be observing our communion service. The following Sunday, April 10th is Palm Sunday, 1130 a.m. And that Friday will be Good Friday, our Good Friday service at 8 p.m. We have anointed speakers for all three of these services, for Palm Sunday, for Good Friday. Um, we have two speakers on those days. And then Sunday, April 17th, which concludes everything, Resurrection Sunday at 1130 a.m. These are our announcements, and this is our schedule. And we pray, God, that you just have... Uh, your way in all of this, that you just elevate us to a, a special divine place, and we will give you the glory and the praise. Amen. Amen. We thank God for our song. We thank God for our prayer and for our time of fasting. And we invite you to turn at this time to the scripture. We've been saying in the entirety of the service, but turn to uh Psalm 18, we're going to read verses 1 through 3. And then after that, if you would turn to Romans chapter 8, and we'll read verse 31 there. Psalm 
18. We're reading verses 1 through 3, and then we'll go to Romans chapter 8, verse 31, and we'll just read that scripture <clears throat> that's in the King James Version of both of these verses, Romans 8 and 31, after we read Psalms 18 and uh, verses 1 through 3. And we'll give you a moment to turn to these scriptures and we're going to have some uh, banners as we always often do put up. We're going to, again, we try to leave them long enough because we have saints who jot down notes from these banners and we have some who take pictures. So we're going to try to, uh, you know, meet everybody's need in all of this. So just have, uh, bear with us and please be patient on this but we are going to go forward in the Lord. Amen. Psalm 18 verses one through three from the King James version of God's word. And it reads on this wise, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer my God, L, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Okay. My, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Verse three, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall my calling upon him, my calling upon him. So shall I be saved from my enemies. So again, it's that balance where of course, the scriptures say to call upon the Lord and we shall be saved. This is what David said. Those that call upon the Lord is in the book of Romans shall be saved. Those that call upon the name of the Lord. But what are we going to say about him? What are, we, what are we going to say to our situations about him before we call on him or after we call on him? And that's what David has said in these previous verses that we're going to say. Romans 8 and 31 Romans 8 and 31 says, what shall we then say to these things? What shall we sit then say to these things? W what we're going to say is this. If God is for us, if God be for us, who can be against us? If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. The, thus ends the reading of God's word. We, we were looking for certain titles and, and, you know, some things came, some things went, some things captured it. And what we settled on by the leading of the Holy Ghost is a familiar phrase, a familiar uh, statement that is made in the body of Christ. It's even a song that um, is sung and we're not going to go ahead and sing it. But today's message is simply this. My God is an awesome God. My God is an awesome God. This is what we want to tell our circumstances, our situations, our issues, our problems, our concerns. My God is an awesome God. And we know that there's scripture to support that. And this is not necessarily where we're going to go. But we do want to declare that my God is an awesome God. Amen. That is our title today. That is our message. And in all of this, in all of this, we want to declare as we go back to the scriptures that we are reading today. David, again, is writing this psalm. And what is a part of this psalm? is where David has written this in uh, 2 Samuel 2, um, 2 Samuel uh, 22 verses 1, 2. Actually, the psalm 
is a mirror. This particular psalm is a mirror of what David has written in Psalm uh, 2 and 22. And in that psalm, in that psalm, David has been delivered from his enemies and he's been delivered from King. And I have that in quotes. He's been delivering from King Saul because Saul was never anointed to be the king of Israel. He was anointed to be the captain. And he, he kept doing things that weren't right in the sight of God. And it said the kingship was taken away, even though he was in the, the position and he was called king. He was never officially God's king. But in this, Saul has been killed, along with Jonathan, the end of 1 Samuel. Saul has been killed. Now, he has chased David. He has uh, trapped David in a cave. He has, he has just been after David, but now he's ki been killed by the Philistine army. And David says, now I'm delivered from Saul. And then there are different enemies, the Amalekites, the Philistines, all, you know, Gibeonites, different ones that David, David has fought against and he has won these battles. And he's at this time of reflection. He's at a time of just sitting back and not saying he's at ease in Zion, but he's sitting and he's reflecting over who God has been to him and what God has done. Goliath, the lion and the bear while he was in the field, all of these particular enemies, and then again, Saul. And he says in these Psalms, he says, I will love thee, O Lord. I will love thee. I will just embrace thee. Lord God, I just, you know, what else can you say? That says it all. I will love thee, O Lord. And then he gives nine descriptions of who God is to him. Nine descriptions in this Psalm. And he says, as we've read here, that God is his strength, number one, his rock, number two, his fortress, number three, his deliverer, number four, his God, his El, his almighty God, Elohim, number five. He says, my strength again, and we'll explain that, number six. He says, his buckler, we'll explain, number seven, the horn of his salvation, number eight, and his high tower. This is who God is, and this is who God was to David, and this is who God is to us. And He, God wants us during this time of fasting to declare these things, to say, you're, Lord, you're my high tower. Lord, you're my strength. You know, when situations come to say, Father, uh, I will call upon you, as verse 3 said, amen, but also to the situations that we're in. You're in a uh, illness uh, time, a season where a bed of affliction and you uh, can call on the Lord. Absolutely. But say to that illness, my God is a deliverer. My God is my strength. He will see that I get through you, your, whatever your, the sickness is. And there are some people who, again, will say that they don't really see, you know, I'm not talking to no measles, you know, that, that they kind of look at it that way. And again, stick with us this week and next week where we'll see that the Bible authorizes and promotes talking to different situations. We're going to see that. But today, what are we going to say to it? David said, he's my deliverer. David said, he's my strength. David said, he's my rock. When we look back at uh, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 22, where this song comes from. Now, what we, what the scholars believe as this is written is that David uh, had just kind of come out of battle and he had heard also about Saul being killed. And he was just in a, in a, a, a season where, okay, I don't have any more battles right now. And he's sitting and he's reflecting as a, about probably a 30 year old, 28, 29, 30 year old soldier. He's reflecting on who God is. This is what they are believing about uh, Psalm, uh, about 2 Samuel 22. Then when we get to this Psalm, when we get to this Psalm, David has been the king for a while. David is now in the palace. David has been the king. And some believe that he's also been, uh, is near the end of his kingship. There's, that's what some scholars believe. And in 2 Samuel 22, 
the belief is that David had written, you know, the parts of Second Samuel, the different things that that come across, and then at the end of it, he writes this song. It wasn't part of the original writing, but he, I won't say he stuck it in, but he wanted this to be a part of this account, a part of these chronicles. And then when we get to Psalm, when we get to Psalm 18, David now older, now more experienced, now having gone through some things, says, as we see in the the title of the Psalm, where it says, um, to the chief musician, a Psalm of David, that uh, a servant of the Lord who spake unto the Lord the words of this song on, in the day that he was delivered from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, so now we see that now it's to the chief musician of the palace that David is bringing this song. So it's kind of like something we see in the entertainment industry nowadays that we, you know, we, let's face it, it's all around us. It's like a reboot. It's like a reboot. It's the song that I sang back then, and now I want to put it out there again. I want to sing this song in the palace. I want to say it wasn't just how I was feeling back then when I first said it. I feel the same way now, and I've got even more reason. I've got even more uh, experience with God to declare that he is everything that I'm saying he is in this psalm, and this one, Psalm 18 starts off with something that he didn't say in 2 Samuel 22. He says, I will love thee, O Lord. I will love thee. Amen. So this is what this where this psalm comes from as he's reflecting on these deliverances. And let's see some of what God, what um David rather is saying in these psalms and um just kind of highlight some of this a little bit. He says that the Lord is his strength. Now that's in verse one. And when he says the Lord is his strength, um, I don't want to jump too far ahead. First, he's saying he's the one that empowered him to survive and defeat his enemies. This is what the Lord being his strength is. Now he uses a particular word for strength here. That word, I'll put that banner up in a moment, but he uses a particular word for strength here, the word sir in the Hebrew, S-U-R, that it is his, uh, it, like his place of refuge. And um, he says again, that God has been his strength. God was the one that empowered him to survive and to defeat his enemies. And this is what God has done for you. Why you survive, why you are able to fight back. No, we don't always feel like fighting, but in the midst of it, there are times when we, there was the desire for many of us to say, you know what, I just give up on this thing, but God has been our strength. And what we wanna say to situations is, I'm not even fighting back against you in my own strength. I'm fighting back with the strength of God. Second uh, Corinthians 10 talks about the the, pow the uh, um, mighty power of God that um, is strong enough to the pulling down of strongholds, okay, to the pulling down of strongholds. It's God's strength that we're using. It's not our own. He says that God is his rock, and he um, says this also in Second Samuel, and he says it more than once, and he says it as a substitute for the word strength. In Second Samuel verse uh, 22 and 2, he says, the Lord is my rock. In verse 3, he said, the God of my rock. He uses the word rock quite a bit. And here again, the word rock indicates that place of shelter and a place of safety and a secure standing, a secure place of shelter, safety, and secure standing, four S's, shelter, safety, and secure standing. This is where, and this is what uh, the rock is. When the, uh, when the message came last week, where we talked, as we said, it was kind of a prelude into it, where the Lord talked about the ones that hear his commandments and obey them, it would be like the man who built his house where? 
on a rock, on a safe foundation, a secure standing. That's what the Lord was to David. The Lord was his rock. And um, being his rock, it, 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 there were places where they, the soldiers would dwell. They would hide out. They would be on this cliff over here, These what they call these crags of the rock. They would hide there and they would get that, that uh, secure position so that they could kind of see the enemy. They could fight back. They could prepare their weapons. David said the Lord was his rock. Then he also says that the Lord is his deliverer and um, his fortress. Okay, the Lord being his deliverer and his fortress. Now, where uh, we see in verse two, again, the Lord is my rock and my fortress, that place of strength. Okay, his place of strength where he's surrounded and when he's protected. So this is the place where he goes to regroup. This is the place where he goes, where he doesn't have to really fear the arrows that are flying, where he doesn't have to really fear the, the weapons that are being used against him because he's in that place of safety. Okay. The mountains that were surrounding about him, it was a place of concealment and a place of security again. So that's why you kind of see rock and fortress together, that place of safety and that place of being surrounded. And this is what God says he is to us. This He is our fortress. He is our strong tower. If you read Psalm 91, you begin to see these places, these uh, statements that are made that say God is our fortress, that God is our high tower. God is our place of security. Then he says in verse uh, two also, where he says that God is his deliverer, that God is his deliverer in the hour of trial and in the hour of peril. He says that God is the one who made a way of escape for him, that God is the one who made a way of escape that God brought him out. We know all these scriptures. We read them all the time where the word says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. We see the scriptures that, that say that uh, in second Corinthians, where it says that, um, that there are many temptations that are going to come, that the Lord allows those temptations to come. And it says, but he will not allow it to be something that we cannot handle. But with the temptation, he will make a way of escape. He will be our deliverer. Second uh, Corinthians 10 and 1, it says that the Lord delivered the stages of salvation where the Lord delivered and he does deliver and he will yet deliver. Deliverance is a form of what salvation is. Deliverance is a form of escape. It says um, David saw so many times how the Lord made a way of escape when he had to get out of Dodge, where he had to get out of the cave, where Saul is falling asleep and David goes right up to him, cuts a piece of his robe off and comes back and wakes Saul up. I could have killed you, but I didn't. And Saul said, I'll leave you alone. Way of escape a where God was his deliverer. So this is who David says that God is, that God has been his deliverer. Then we see in the uh, scriptures that he says, you are my God. You are my L. You are my strong God. You are the one who gives me strength and power. We see that there's a common thread in this psalm where he talks about strength, where David keeps talking about strength. He used different words, but he comes back to strength. And he says, you are my L, you are my God. You are the one who puts um, um, strength in my soul. It says um, that he is my all in all. This is just some of the different comments about who God is. And there's so much just to say, you're not, you're not just the God, you're not just up there. You are my God, you are my uh, object of 
adoration. You are my all in all. This is what David is saying. So when things come to tempt us to say, worship this, worship that, no, I, no situation, no temptation, no uh, relationship, no uh, seemingly good job, but I, you know, I don't really know whether you're right or wrong. What do you say to it? My God is my strength. He is my all in all. I adore and worship him and him alone. No one else, nobody else, nothing else. This is the way God wants us to begin to speak when things want to pull us away from God, when things want us to start worshiping them instead of him. He says, no, you say he is my God. He is my God. The, my, the one who puts strength in my soul. Maybe today I'm not feeling like fighting like I should, but I'll get there because my God will give me the strength that I need. Then he says in this same verse, again, in verse two, after he says, my God, again, he says, he is my strength. He is my strength. Now, again, this is a different word than the word that is used in uh, Psalm 18 and one. It's a different word. And this word, I'm going to show you these two words in an, another banner I'll put up in a minute. But this word is a different word. And this word, uh, the idea behind it, according to the scholars, is that it, it, this God being our strength is he's our source. He is where our strength begins. Remember all of these, it just seems to keep uh, revolving around God being our strength. So when we, the first time it says where God is our strength, that God is the one who empowers us. Then this one, it is our strength. Again, he's our source. He's our fountain where the power comes from, our origin. And this is um, also, again, this word, is if you looked it up in the Hebrew, it's also the word rock. It's the word rock because again, in Psalm 22, I'm sorry, in a second Samuel 22, David doesn't use the word strength. He uses the word rock. So it could be a little bit confusing. That's why you got to go through it. But David uses the word rock instead of the word strength. So again, he, what he's talking about is God being the source of his power. God being the one he goes to when he doesn't feel like it, but he says, I'm going to step back and let God step in here. God is my source of strength. Again, we don't fight under our own power. We don't fight because of our own faith, our own will, our own ability, but God is our source and God is our strength. Then he says, that he is our uh, buckler. In the King James, he uses the word buckler. In the in some of the other versions, it will use the word shield. That's what a buckler is. A buckler, the difference between a buckler and a shield, because in effect, a let, let's say it this way, a buckler is always a shield, but a shield is not always a buckler. Okay, I'll say that again. A buckler is always a shield, but a shield is not always a buckler because in the armies, they would have the big shields that they could cover themselves with, that they could, uh, all of them, uh, they could get in a group and just put the shield around them and all kind of make like a dome. So when arrows came or rocks came, it would uh, bounce off of the shield. That was the largest shield that we see in different places that were carried. But a buckler, a buckler was like a small hand shield. It was um, it, it was smaller than the big uh, from the head to the knees type of shield. This was a smaller one that if you think, I don't mean to get carnal on you, but you think of like a Captain America or in some, some of the movies where we see where they have the small uh, shield that's strapped to their arm and they just move it around against the sword. So that's what a buckler is. That It was a, a defensive, smaller shield that could be moved around. It wasn't that big. It, could, it was more mobile. They could uh, do more with it in terms of 
defending certain parts of the body instead of just one big uh, part that from the head to the shoulders. And you, of course, you wanted to have them both. But sometimes you couldn't necessarily carry the bigger shield, but you could carry the smaller one. David said that the Lord was his shield who defends both his head and his heart. He defends both his head and his heart. In Psalm 91, verse 4, we see the psalmist who they believe to be Moses says that the Lord's truth will be the shield, the bigger part, and the buckler, the smaller, no matter what comes against you. They, uh, Paul said in Ephesians that the shield of faith will quench the fiery darts of the enemy that comes against us. So God is our shield. God is our protection. He is our defense. His truth defends us against whatever the enemy is trying to send against us. And this is what you have to know, that whatever it is in his word, that we declare his word as our truth. And that will defend our head and our heart, our mind when we start thinking wrong, our heart when we start feeling a certain way combat it with that truth heart i'm you know you're feeling like you don't trust god anymore but i declare unto you god is my shield he is my buckler he defends me when i uh, don't feel when i feel afraid when i don't feel like i can trust certain things when i'm feeling the hurt he's my shield against that look at Philippians, the fourth chapter, where it says when we present our petitions to God, that God gives us that peace that passes all understanding when we pray to him with thanksgiving. There's a peace that comes that passes all understanding that does what? Guards our heart and our mind. This is the buckler. This is the buckler. This is that small that shield that you put up on, on your mind, that you put in front of your heart when things come against it. When they tried to enter in, David said the Lord was the shield and the Lord is his strength. Now, we said also that um, as far as his strength is concerned, here are these two words again. That first word for strength, Kezek in the Hebrew, uh, number 2391 in the Strong's, again, is strength or help. It's strength or help. It's kind of like the physical strength. It's only used in Psalm 18 and 2, and it was omitted uh, it, from 2 Samuel 22. It, it is the, the, the word is used there, but it's not translated as strength. It's translated as rock. But it is, again, the uh, strength and the help. And then the second strength, that word sir in the Hebrew, number 6697, is another one translated as rock in 2 Samuel, but it's more of a solid mass. And like we said, it's the source of strength. It is what rises up in you, it is looked at more like a cliff instead of a piece of rock. So it is a bigger piece of strength that comes in um, second Samuel, I mean, uh, in uh, the second word for strength, that word, sir. So we don't wanna make too much out of it, but the bottom line of it is you, the first strength, that's your help, that's your power that God gives you when you don't feel like going on. That second strength, that's same. it's the same uh, power, but now the focus is more on more strength from a better source more strength from a better source. That's that second strength. So David uses two words for strength in this Psalm, in Psalm 18, in verse one and verse two. And all of this, I hope it's not beginning to kind of drone on, but this is what David said about God. He said, this is who you are. You're my strength. You're my God. You're my deliverer, my rock, my fortress, my shield, my buckler, my horn of salvation my high tower. These are the things he said, and this is what God wants you to say as you are going in the various situations. So Hezek, strength or help, sir, that uh, solid mass of strength, that source and that foundation 
of strength. I hope everyone had time uh, to write these things. Then we get to his horn, his horn. Now, again, in our Bible study, we're going to go more deeply into the horn of his salvation. But here, um, this word horn of salvation was another word for David's strength and his defense. And it is also, when we talk about the horn of his salvation, a horn ultimately means multiple powers, multiple powers, multiple sides of power. We're going to go into that on Friday night, but it is where we see the horn was used as a shofar, a declaration calling the army together. Here it, it's time. Let's go fight. It was a receptacle for holding anointed oil. That's when Samuel poured the oil on David. What did he pour it out of? A horn. It was a defense mechanism for different animals. We've seen bulls. We've seen the rams where they use that horn to defend themselves against uh, different animals. And if the other animal had a horn, then it was really a battle. He So that horn was a strength and it was a defense and it implied multiple powers, multiple powers. So when you declare that the Lord is the horn of your salvation, it means you can fight whatever way you need to fight in order to get the victory. It may not be the same fight all the time, may not be the same process, may not be the same response but you've got multiple powers because a horn represents multiple ways of fighting back the horn of your salvation. And please make it a point to join us on Friday, where we're going to talk more and in more detail about this horn, about the horn of salvation. Then it's, he says, he is my stronghold or my high tower my high tower. That is where he called it a place of refuge, but it was also a place. It was also a place where David could see the enemy afar off, where he could see the enemy from a great distance and be protected from the adversary. And what we want to mention about, again, the fortress, and we've said also that that fortress is uh, 2 Samuel 2, 22 and 3, my high tower, my refuge that, that you saved me from violence. It is the place of safety for us to go. It is the place where we can just come aside and pray. You know, there, there are times on, I'm sure many of us on our jobs, there have been times where things are, are chaotic, things are, you know, you, you hope this person doesn't say one more word to you, otherwise you might have to repent, you know, these just going back and forth, and you have to go aside for a few minutes, and you just come to yourself, and you pray, and you breathe in and breathe out, and say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that's where he's been your high tower, that's where he's been the place of refuge, that's where you could take a step back and see what the enemy is trying to do. Pick up on some spirits that are operating. Pick up on some uh, demons that are in the mix of, of the chaos. You can see them. It may be at home. Yes, things are going on with friends and family, and you, you just take a step back. And in this place, you can say, you know what, because you know, the situation comes and you, you you seem a little confused or a little overwhelmed and you can step back and say, no situation, you are not going to overwhelm me because the Lord is my high tower. He's my place of refuge where I can see you even before you fully engage in what it is you're doing. I can see you and I can be protected from you. The Lord is my high tower. The Lord is my defense. The Lord is my place of refuge. These are the things that David 
called God in the midst of everything. He saw that God was a place where he could go to just kind of collect himself in and where he could go and just kind of get a breath and say, okay, this is how I'm going to fight back now. These are all nine of these particular titles that he gave to God. So in this, the, in all of this, we may not declare everything the, the same way that David declared it. We may not say it all the uh, same way that David said it, but this is what we need to remember in this, this upcoming situations that we find ourselves in or going to find ourselves in, especially, especially if you would get on uh, latch hold to this. Again, David had been fighting and now David sees I'm on my way to what I was anointed to be. I'm on my way to where I was anointed to go. If you go back to 2 Samuel uh, chapter 22, where he has made all these comments and all these statements. And then um, when we see this, we see David talks about his steps being enlarged. And we see about David getting ready to acquire the kingship. This is, you know, to fully acquire it. This is what's going on in these chapters. And now he remembers who God has been to him and he declares it openly. And this is what God wants us to declare. You're my high tower. Okay. And the situation comes where it wants to get your eyes off of God. It wants to attack you over and over and over again. And God wants you to say, no, wait a minute, hold it situation, hold it chaos in the office, hold it, um, mess going on in my, in, in the school, in the classroom, stuff going on in the job. I can take, take a, take a step back and reflect because he's my high tower. I can go back in there and I can pray this thing through and get the victory because he is my strength. I can fight whatever way I need to fight because he is my horn the horn of my salvation. I can go in there and not worry about who's going to talk back against me, who's going to speak, who's going to say what I am, who's going to attack uh, my character because he's my shield. He's my buckler. This is how God wants us to begin to talk in the time of this fasting to declare who he is. Amen. Are we going to say it the same way that David says it? Not necessarily, but we are going to say it our way, declaring our God and who he is. And remember this about God. Nobody has his track record. Okay. Nobody has his track record. Nobody has never failed. Nobody has lied once in a while. Nobody has been unable to bring what he said he would bring to pass to pass. The word lets us know that when God releases something, this is in the book of Isaiah, it says that when God releases it, that that word that God has released, it will not, it will not return unto him void. It will not return unto him empty. It says that what, what it will do is it will accomplish what he has sent it to do. And it says that it will prosper in where he sends it. That's what God wants us to know. So in all of this here again, here what it is that we need to know and what it is that we need to understand is that God, again, Psalm, I mean, Isaiah 55 and 11. He says that, um, well, verse 10 says, as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and it doesn't come back, it doesn't rain. And then the rain says, oh no, I'm not going on the ground and go back to heaven. It lands. It makes the ground wet. That's what it was sent for. It fills the dams. That's what it was sent for. Likewise with the snow. It says it waters the earth and it makes it bring forth and bud so that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. 
That's what my word is like. When I send my word, it's supposed to have an effect. It's supposed to do what I've sent my word to do. So this is why when we look at God's word here in uh, in Psalm 18 and in 2 Samuel, that God wants us to repeat that word. God wants us to declare that word and to know nobody has his track record. Nobody uh, is like our God. And because that is the case, because he's the deliverer, because he's the fortress, because he's the high tower, because he's God, because he's the shield, the buckler, because he is our strength one and our strength two, because he is our deliverer, because he's our fortress and all of these things that God is. Because of all of these things, if God is for us, who can be against us? Who can be against us? This is um, where I'm leaning into somewhere deeper where we're going based on that verse. Because Paul uses it in Romans, the eighth chapter, where he talks in the previous verses about who God foreknew, about all things working together for good, because we are more than conquerors all of these things. And then after the verse, he says, therefore, there's no condemnation. There's no persecution that um, where he talks about separating us from the love of Christ because of tribulation or distress or nakedness or peril or sore. All of these things, these are things, these are things. What shall we say to these things. I'm kind of giving away a little bit of where I'm going next week, but what shall we say to these things? What we will say is he's my deliverer. He is my fortress. He is my high tower. He is my strength. If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can be against us? This is what God wants us to know, especially during this time of fasting. Situations arise. And of course, we go to God. But we also declare that we recognize the situation. We know what it is. You are exposed. We see you from afar off. We see you from close by. And who our God is has already been established. I don't have to wonder is God my deliverer? I don't have to wonder, is God my fortress? Is God my high tower where I could take refuge from this situation? I don't have to wonder about that. I declare it. I declare it. Who our God is has already been established. Declare it with authority. Declare it with authority. This is what David began to do. And in all of these, in the psalm that he wrote and in the song that he wrote in uh, 2 Samuel 22, David, again, as a young man, <clears throat> as a young man, declared this, going on to his kingship, going on to his acquiring of the throne. We know that David made some mistakes. We know that David did some things wrong, but David declared, God is my deliverer. And what we want to understand about that, God is, is my fortress, my high tower, my strength, all of these things that he said, it didn't change who God was. God didn't all of a sudden, when David sinned with Bathsheba, that God stopped being his deliverer, that God stopped being his high tower or his strength. It didn't stop. David had to get back on that particular um, foundational truth with God. He had to get back there. That's why we see where he wrote Psalm 51. And he said, take not away the joy of my salvation. Before he was saying, you're the horn of my salvation. It didn't change who God was. But now because of David's sin, now he, he can't be as free and as, 
as empowered to declare it with the joy that he would have been if he didn't sin. God is not going to change. So why are you saying that, Bishop? I'm saying this again to say that it does not matter what you are carrying as you're entering into this time of fasting. It doesn't matter. What matters is God is still who David said he was and who you're saying he is. God is still that. I'm going to put these, these, um, these banners back up again for those who didn't get everything, for those who are writing. And while I'm putting them up, I'm just going to make these, uh, these statements to you. Again, here is uh, where he's the strength, where he is the strength, um, where David said God is his strength, the one that empowered him to survive against his enemies, that he is his rock. And there are so many Psalms and, and uh, uh, scriptures that declare this. Psalm 28 and one, you can write if you need to while I'm just reading some of these scriptures. Psalm 28 and one says, unto thee, O Lord, will I cry, my rock. Do not be silent unto me, lest, Lord, if you're silent unto me, I will become like them that go down into the pit. Psalm 28 and one. Psalm 62 and two, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. This is something, again, that we've said in these scriptures. He is my defense. He is my salvation and my glory. He is the rock of my strength and my refuge in God. Uh, Psalm 91 and two, it says, I will say of the Lord, this is what you're talking, talk to that situation. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, high tower, and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. Again, Psalm 144 and 2. You can jot the scriptures down, look them up on your own. It says in Psalm 144 and 2, my goodness and my fortress, my high tower, my shield, my deliverer, in he who I trust, who subdueth my people under me. Let me read that one again. My goodness, my fortress, my high tower, my deliverer, my shield, in he whom in whom I and he in whom I trust, who subdueth the people under me. David continues to call God his shield, his deliverer, his high tower and his fortress. Again, that was his place of strength and his rock. Um, he says that he is, again, deliverer, the one who made a way of escape. His God, my strong, I, I'm putting these up again. I know some write them down, may not have caught everything before. That's why they're up here again. My deliverer, my God, my strong God. Um, my all in all, the one who puts strength in my soul. Okay. Um, Isaiah 32 and two says, and a man shall be as a hiding place from the wind and a cover from the tempest as rivers of water in a dry place as the shadow of of a great rock in a weary land. This is where Isaiah was talking about the effect that God would have on the people of God, on those who trust him. All of these scriptures that we're looking at, again, my deliverer, my God, the object of my adoration, the one who puts strength in my soul, my all in all, my everything, that this is who God is. And then that second word for the word strength, where he says, um, he is my fountain and my source, my shield. He's the one who defends the head and the heart. I put it up, you know, covering when the blows are coming against my mind, when the blows are coming against my emotions, 
my accuser is cast down because I put my shield up and because I'm not trusting and getting my own strength, but I'm trusting in the strength of God. This is a different word in the Hebrew. Again, source, bigger strength. That's what this particular word is covering. And we also said he is the horn, his strength and his defense. And that horn represented multiple powers, multiple ways that you can you can fight different ways. It doesn't have to always be where you're predictable in the way that you do it. God says his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. We may think that God is going to come this particular way. And he says, no, I'm coming back that way. And that he's the fortress. He's the high tower of refuge where David could see an enemy coming from a great distance where we can see, especially through prayer, the Lord says nothing will happen without him warning his prophets. So this is who David is. And we can also, because it's a high tower, we can be protected from the adversary, that this is who David is. I pray you've gotten all of that, that you've received all of this, and that you are ready, starting at six o'clock tonight, going before God, having this time of prayer, reading this Psalm, saying back to God, Father, you are, as David said, you are my strength, that you are my God, saying unto the Lord, you're my deliverer, you're my fortress, saying unto the Lord that you are my buckler or my shield, that you are my high tower, that you are my God, you're my, my uh, strength, you know, that you just declare all of this unto the Lord and get ready when the situations that you're in or that rise up, when they begin to come, that something rises up because again, you don't have to do it under your own strength, but when things rise up, that this word, my deliverer, he's my deliverer, that it rises up in your spirit. Remember the song at the beginning, again, that our minister Barbara was singing. And it was that, again, our fortress and that he's our, our strength. She, uh, our El Elyon, just the different statements of who God is, that he's the author and the finisher, that he is the alpha and the omega, all of these statements that we know who God is. Let the enemy know. Let the situation know who your God is. Tell it about God. I know you've been here for a long time, but my God is a deliverer. I know you have had an easy time over my life from this point on, but now my God is my strength. I know that you have been that stronghold, but now I'm changing strongholds. Now I'm in the high tower when, when I see you coming, I know how to respond and I know what to do. This is what God is saying in this fast. Tell your situation about your God and be sure to tell that situation when you're talking about your God, that your God is an awesome God, that your God is an awesome God. It says in Deuteronomy 7 and 21, Deuteronomy 7 and 21, you shall not be terrified of them for the Lord your God, the great and awesome God is among you. You shall not be terrified of them. Deuteronomy 7 and 21, for the Lord your God, the great and awesome God is among you. Deuteronomy 10 and 21 says, he is your praise and he is your God who has done these great, who has done for you these great and awesome things which your eye has seen. He has done these great and awesome things which your eyes have seen. And finally, Deuteronomy 10, 17, a few verses before that, it says, for the Lord your God is God, is God of God and Lord of Lords, the great God mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality, nor does he take any bribes. That's Deuteronomy 
721, 10, 17, and 10, 21 from the New King James Version. Today's message, our God, my God is an awesome God. We're going to tell our situations about him. We're going to set ourselves aside for this time of fasting. The Lord will tell you what to do and how to do it. You know, there's various ways like that horn where it's multiple powers. There's different ways to fast. But again, let the Lord confirm what it is that you are, are doing. As he said in the book of Joel, call, sanctify ye a fast. Call my people aside and sanctify ye a fast. This is what the Lord is having us to do. And we're going aside in fasting. Today's message, my God is an awesome God. We pray that you have received from this word. And if I may offer this word of prayer for you before we go into our time of fasting. And remember, it begins at six o'clock tonight as we go before the Lord. As we bow our heads and close our eyes in this Father, in the name of Jesus, we're entering into a time of prayer, a time of fasting, a time of reading your word, a time of increasing in our knowledge of you, a time of walking more in your righteousness. Our desire is to walk more perfectly before you as this time of fasting has come. We know sometimes, Lord, that the adversary will try to discourage us from coming aside, will try to discourage us from abstaining from food and drink, abstaining from programs that are of no spiritual value. Look for pleasure and look for ease. But Lord God, we're committed unto you in this time. So when these things rise up, let us remember that you are an awesome God, that you have us in a place of refuge, that you're our high tower, you are our fortress, you're our defense, you're our God, our strength, our shield. And Lord God, we will declare this to the enemy, to the situations, to whatever will come to rise up against us with authority and with power. Bless, keep, protect, and encourage these thy people in this time of fasting so that we can uh, emerge on Resurrection Sunday where we can say, truly, the Lord has blessed us. Truly, the Lord has taught us. Truly, the Lord is good. We thank you for David and his confession. And we thank you that we can take it today and speak it back, not only to you and declare it about you, but say to the situation, meet my God. This is who he is. And this is who I am trusting in, in the name of Jesus. We thank you, we praise you, we adore you, we worship you, you are mighty and you are great. This is our prayer and we offer it to you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hallelujah, thank God, thank God, thank God. He is our God and we shall worship him. We're uh, again, emails, go on Facebook, let me know you want a copy of this Fasting Perspectives. There's some we're sending out this afternoon to those who have requested it. We're going to bless the Lord and declare who he is to the situations, to these things that come. My God is an awesome God. We pray you've been encouraged. Bishop Archie saying fast, well, simple truth, family and friends and saints of the most high God. He's awesome. He's mighty and he shall deliver in him. Shall we trust God bless you and heaven continue to smile upon you in Jesus's name. We pray. Amen. And amen.